Welcome to the award-winning Consumer Finance Monitor podcast, where we explore important new developments in the world of consumer financial services and what they mean for your business, your customers, and the industry. This is a weekly show brought to you by the Consumer Financial Services Group at the Ballard Spar Law Firm. And I'm your host, Alan Kaplinsky, the former practice group leader for 25 years and now senior counsel of the Consumer Financial Services Group at Ballard Spar. And I will be moderating today's program. For those of you who want even more information, don't forget about our blog, ConsumerFinanceMonitor.com. We've hosted our blog since July 21, 2011, when the Consumer Financial Services Bureau became operational. So there's a lot of relevant industry content there. We also regularly host webinars on subjects of interest to those in the industry. To subscribe to our blog or to get on the list of our webinars, please visit us at BallardSpar.com. And if you like our podcast, please let us know. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube Music, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, please let us know if you have any ideas for other topics that we ought to consider covering or speakers that we should consider inviting as guests on our show. And I'm also very pleased to tell our listeners that our podcast show was recently ranked by Good To Be Social as the best podcast show among law firm podcast shows in the United States devoted exclusively to consumer financial services. Good To Be Social is a prominent law firm consulting firm owned by Best Lawyers. We're very gratified by this recognition from one of the country's leading social media consultants for law firms. Today's podcast show is a repurposing of a webinar which we conducted on March 21, entitled, Has the CFPB's Final Credit Card Late Fees Rule Dealt Cardholders a Winning or Losing Hand? Before uh, I introduce you to our speakers today, and there'll be very brief introductions except for our special guest. Uh, just to guess, babies basically set the table. Uh, March 5th, the CFPB issued its final rule, which lowered the safe harbor late fee amount that be, can be charged by issuers other than small card issuers to $8. While that particular thing that they did, lowering that safe harbor uh, amount to $8, has garnered most of the attention of the media. The final rule also includes other significant changes that merit attention, not only by large issuers, but also small credit card issuers. So we're going to cover the waterfront today. I mean, we're going to talk about how the final rule differs from the proposed rule and the existing rule. Who is a small card issuer under the final rule? Changes impacting issuers other than smaller card issuers, changes impacting smaller card issuers themselves, changes impacting all card issuers, operational implications of the final rule, impact on card issuers, including regulatory considerations that are involved in mitigating lost late fee revenue. Uh, We're also, of course, but we're going to leave it toward the end, because, uh, you know, we never give away the punchline right at the beginning of a, uh, when you're telling a joke, uh, we're going to really take the proverbial deep dive uh, into the litigation brought by the industry in the Northern District of Texas, the Fort Worth Division, which unfortunately for the industry has not been going so well. And then we'll touch upon Congressional Review Act and whether there's any hope of getting it tossed out on that basis. Uh, The answer is no. Well, well, let me just say this. When we were planning for this webinar, I was concerned 
Well, I, it, it was concern may be the wrong word, but I thought by the, by the time of the webinar, there was a very strong chance that a court, probably in Texas, would issue a preliminary injunction and that the industry would feel a sense of relief and have not as much interest in the nitty gritty of the rule and and how to implement the rule and the operational and regulatory concerns. Well, was I wrong, as were a lot of other people, and John Colhane will get into that toward the end of the program. So let me now turn to our speakers uh, for today, and I hope my colleagues don't mind, but John Colhane, Ron Vasky, Kristen Larson are so well known uh, in the industry and uh, for being involved in many of our webinars and podcasts that I'm not going to tell you anything more about them. But I am going to introduce our very special guest, Andrew Negrinis. Andrew previously served as the sole enforcement economist at the CFPB, and he led the Bureau's economic analysis and evaluation in more than 70 cases. He's managed investigations relating to allegations of unfair or deceptive practices, fair lending, disputes between financial services providers and lenders, allegations of mortgage and student loan servicing issues, as well as credit card fees, dark patterns, debt collection, et cetera. Uh, He worked alongside state attorney generals, as well as the Department of Justice and personnel at the Comptroller of the Currency on a broad range of consumer finance matters. He was there practically from the beginning uh, when Richard Cordray was director, and he basically worked for every director and acting director. He was there for the beginning of the term of Rohit Chopra. So we're very pleased to have Andrew, uh, who is the very experienced economist in, who devotes a lot of attention to consumer finance involved today. So um, we're going to begin now with uh, the first item on the agenda, uh, the final rule, safe harbor, and then the final rule, smaller card issuers. I'm going to turn the program over to my colleague, Ron Fasky. Thank you, Alan. Uh, the first slide we have here is kind of what we call a cheat sheet that just kind of gives you a basic summary of the, the rule and the, the changes from the current Reg Z and differences from the proposal. As Alan suggested, the difference, um, the late fee safe harbor amount depends on whether you are a larger card issuer or a smaller card issuer as defined in the rule. We'll take a look at that in a little more depth in a minute, but what in general it means is that if you at any time during the last calendar year had more than 1 million open credit card accounts, then you are a larger card issuer, 1 million or more. If you had less than a million at all times during the prior calendar year, you and your affiliates, you are a smaller card issuer. If you're a smaller card issuer, the rule here doesn't change a lot for you. The big change really is just the change from the existing safe harbor, safe harbor amounts from $30 to $32 for the initial late fee violation uh, and $41 to $43 for the any repeat violations within six months. Big change, though, is if you are a larger card issuer, a million accounts or more, there the late fee safe harbor goes all the way down to $8, uh, and that applies to both the initial violation as well as any subsequent violation, any repeat violation within the the next six months. Uh, For smaller charge card issuers, you can still take advantage of the alternative 3% of delinquent balance late fee amount that are at least for late fees, for late, late fees that are applicable to balances at least two cycles delinquent. That's in lieu of the the alternate or the second repeat violation fixed amount. For all issuers, there is no change in the safe harbors for other penalty fees. 
only late fees that are affected. Uh, other than increases in the amounts from $30 to $32 for the initial violations and $41 to $43 for repeat violations. The other good news here is that there's no change in the absolute cap on penalty fee amounts, including late fees, which will remain at 100% of the violation amount. The proposed rule had a, a cap applicable to late fees that would have capped it at 25% of the amount of the delinquent balance. Uh, that did not survive. That did not make it into the final rule. A little more definition onto what it means to be a smaller card issuer. Um, that is, as I mentioned, if during the prior calendar year, so looking to start now in 2023, if at any time the issuer had 1 million or more open accounts, that is a larger card issuer. Open account is defined uh, as an open credit card account. Credit card account has the Reg Z definition it's an open account if the cardholder can obtain extensions of credit on the account or there is an outstanding balance on the account that's not charged off. Temporary suspensions, for any reason, are still considered open accounts. Uh, the $1 million threshold applies to the issuer together with its affiliates. So affiliates as defined under the Bank Holding Company Act, the issuer and all of its com affiliates combined had uh, 1 million or more accounts during the prior calendar year, it is a larger card issuer. From there, I'll turn it over to John to talk about fees based on costs. Thanks, Ron. I'm, I'm actually going to talk about fees based on costs and then just uh, have a, I'll have a few comments on the uh, change that uh, wasn't made that uh, Ron noted about the 25% cap. I don't know that there's a lot to say here at the moment. Basically, nothing happened here. Uh, this is the provision as it uh, existed prior to the CFPB rulemaking proceeding. And I, the, I guess the odd thing about this, uh, if you look at the supplementary information materials uh, accompanying the text of the final rule, is that for all that the CFPB has been uh, throwing the Federal Reserve Board under the bus for its prior rulemaking in this area. Uh, it pretty much agreed with the uh, Federal Reserve Board. Well, it basically agreed that the Federal Reserve Board got it right uh, when it came to deciding how to determine fees based on costs. There's some discussion of the CFPB's interpretation of the Y14 data. Andrew will be saying more about that later. But again, uh, this is uh, really surprising in some respects, uh, agreement with the uh, Federal Reserve Board. So where are we? We're, well, we're right where we used to be. I don't think we've ever seen anybody do this uh, up to now, but it, it seems likely we'll see more attention on it in the future. So uh, what are the rules for fees based on costs? Well, uh, you can set your late fee based on costs. Um, the amount has to uh, represent a reasonable proportion of the total costs incurred as a result of the violation. Once you set it, um, that's only good for a 12-month period. It has to be reevaluated every 12 months. If you decide that your costs no longer support the fee that you had established, then you've got 45 days to lower the fee. Uh, if you decide that your costs have increased, so you determine that your costs have increased, and so you want to increase the fee, then you've got to go through the change in terms process. You still have to go through that process, but uh, this happens to be uh, one of those situations where there's an exception to the right to reject, so cardholders would not get the opportunity to opt out here. Uh, most of the comments about this focused on the exclusions from the cost analysis. And as I said, the CFPB just kept the existing rules in place. And the theory for the existing rules is you're allowed to recover costs that are mitigating a loss, but once that, or, or viol, uh, a violation of the account rules, but once that violation has occurred and you've charged off the account, then anything that happens after that point is uh, mitigating a loss. It's not really 
related to costs incurred with uh, late payment or deterring late payments. So the rules that existed before, as I said, have stayed in place. Things that are excluded, uh, you can't allocate costs of holding reserves against potential losses to these costs. You can't allocate the cost of funding delinquent accounts. Um, you can't allocate costs that are incurred after an account is charged off. And you also can't uh, allocate your forecasting around accounts that will go and your management of accounts uh, in, in trying to predict what accounts might go delinquent uh, in the future. Again, I'll just say what, what I started with. Uh, nothing really changed here. The CFPB kept this rule basically in place as it was. So let me just make a few observations about the change they didn't make. As Ron mentioned, they decided not to impose an additional cap on the amount of the late fee, that is, limiting it to 25% of the amount of the required minimum periodic payment. This is kind of an interesting section in the supplementary information as well, because um, there were a lot of concerns uh, expressed by the industry that that kind of cap would not allow the recovery of fixed costs, um, that credit unions and smaller issuers tend to have a high percentage of accounts where they have uh, small minimum payments, and they also have, uh, tend to have a higher percentage of pre-collection charge-off costs, and that uh, this wouldn't be sufficient to allow them to recover costs. And while the, the CFPB was, by and large, dismissive of comments about cost recovery, here they agreed with the comments that, that, they, that they received and, uh, and then decided to jettison the 25% cap. Obviously, with an $8 fee, that would have meant that, uh, you know, payments uh, that were under, minimum payments under $32 uh, would have been even further restricted, but that's gone. Uh, so let's let's resume a discussion about what's in here and what's permissible now. And so what we wanted to cover next is that a lot of issuers haven't historically used this because of the safe harbor fee being much higher, but it is per still permissible to charge another higher fee. Take, for example, that someone sends in a payment and that payment is returned unpaid by the paying bank. Instead of charging the $8 late fee, if your um, return payment fee was $25, for example, $30, you would be able to charge that fee instead of the $8 late fee. Now, I, I know for a lot of issuers, this will require some additional system programming. But again, that's another alternative to think about in addition to what John mentioned about, you know, looking at whether you want to look at fees based on cost. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our guest speaker, Andrew, to talk a little bit more about the economic analysis related to the rulemaking. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate the invitation to come to speak to all of you. It's a great honor. Um, like Alan was saying, I worked at the CFPB in the enforcement office for, uh, for many years. And uh, while I was there, a lot of things changed. And while I was leaving, there was this new focus on junk fees. What's interesting about junk fees is the CFPB repeatedly cites that there's a lack of competitive forces with uh, back-end junk fees. As you all know, it was in the State of the Union address back on March 8th, 2023. And, uh, and this is part, or this seems to be part of a program to crack down on junk fees. I personally take offense to the idea that these are junk fees because one can easily avoid the fee by paying on time. And also that uh, as I will show later, there's no indication that there's a lack of competitive forces in this market. So the data to use the final rule. So the key is that, as was said before, is that fees must be reasonable and proportional. Of course, you know, I don't have to tell all of you, your lawyers, uh, the problem is one of definition of what constitutes reasonable. According to the CARD Act, a reasonable fee has to be the cost incurred from omission of violation, deterrence, 
uh, conduct of the cardholder or other factors. So it's pretty nebulous as to what it means. It appears the CFPB wants to consider reasonable proportional as a relation to cost structure. Uh, the CFPB considered four primary data sets in developing this, uh, the 2020 propo- three proposal. And of course, now it's 2024, the actual rule. One is the Y14 data set. And this is a, a data from the largest banks um, that is collected by the Federal Reserve Board. The other is the Y14 plus data set, which is an augmentation of that, of the, the first data set. The third is credit card data, debt collection data received from uh, basically from their authority to receive data. And the fourth is the credit card agreement database. So they have this really large database where they just basically get the terms and services from everyone. Now, the Y14 data. So the analysis refers to the Y14 seventh month data. And it, basically what they do here is they're trying to get to the question of the core question of deterrence. So what this data does, it, it has a late fees uh, amount paid by each month, along with balance details, various account of, and borrower cur- characteristics, such as origination credit score, et cetera. The analysis, what they do is they look at six billing cycles and they investigate whether a reduced late fee amount in the seventh month prompts an in- a noticeable increase in late fee uh, payments. In the recent years, they've supplemented this data with data from 2020 and 2021. So their big conclusion is that uh, there is not much of an increase in default in month seven. I don't think it's very earth shattering of a, of a, of a result. There's clearly selection bias here. If you miss basically six late payments, the seventh one is not going to be that impactful, the amount of it. So that's one piece of analysis that they do. What they then do is they use data from uh, the Y14 plus data, which is an extension of Y14. So essentially what they do is they lower the, the asset amount that they need to, uh, to be in the data set. They collect the data. They, they find more things to do their analysis. However, it's really important to note that by their own admission, and I got this quote off the, I believe, the 2023 credit card report. And it says that the Y14 data should not be considered representative of the uncovered portion. So basically, they know very little about what the industry is if you're not in the Y14 plus data. The Y14 plus data is going to cover a lot of financial institutions like credit unions, smaller banks, things like that. And of course, if it's not representative of the uncovered portion, how can it be that representative of the entire market? So they're using data that's not very representative, and they're making these kind of big general sweeping claims to change the industry. So now we get to the point of cost-based calculations. I kind of refer to this as the battle of the accounting standards. Personally, I think this is completely the wrong way to go about things. I more think that the appropriate uh, reasonable proportional standard is not to get fees down to cost. It should actually be getting fees to incorporate other things that fees do, which we'll talk about later, such as deterrence and risk management. So the CFEB, to put it politely, is, uh, and I'm from Canada originally, so I always have to try to put things politely, but the CFEB is trying, it's, it's being, I don't want to be too aggressive, but they're being dismissive over what I think are legitimate complaints about how uh, costs are calculated. So what they do is they, on the Y14M data, and if you're getting confused between Y14, Y14 plus, Y14M, I mean, unless you work in bureaucracy, you don't really, really get a fine appreciation for all these different uh, nomenclature. But the Y14M data is also a Federal Reserve data set. And it was actually created originally for stress testing purposes. And uh, the data points they use are, or the fields they use, are total non-interest expense collections expense, and fee income or late fee income. I don't think it'd be the most fascinating thing in the world to get down into the nitty-gritty of how uh, how fees are split up in the accounts. But as anyone who's ever worked in a large organization like a bank knows or a financial institution knows, there are a lot of ways to allocate costs. And a cost allocation system that's reasonable for stress testing purposes and how you allocate costs across different divisions and product lines may not be the best way to do it when you're dealing with something like credit card late fees and incentives for defaulting and stuff like that, or being late. But essentially, I'm going to walk you through the methodology. 
the first off, they exclude collection and charge off costs, as John mentioned. But they estimate the share of total collection costs that derive from commissions paid to collection agencies and recoveries as a proxy for costs incurred after charge offs. And then they take this to estimate the Y14, they take this estimate to the Y14M data, and they essentially get a ratio of the net fees to before the charge off collection. That's terrible grammar, but the net fees over uh, before charge off collection costs. And what they essentially find is a, is a difference of a, of a factor of five. They find that the fees were $42 beforehand. They divide by five. They get something slightly bigger than eight. They round it down to eight. It's kind of shocking how incredibly simplistic this is. It should be. It's not very well. Like, I mean, yeah, I'm trying to be polite, but it, it's, it's a, not a very profound methodology. So one thing to keep in mind was that a lot of these costs are reported for um, are reported in the Y14M data, and therefore uh, they are essentially for stress testing. The key thing is is that the instructions are somewhat vague, and uh, there was no attempt for uh, made by the CFPB to take this data and to you know, make it uniform to standardize it, and also well, I'm kind of repeating myself here, but and to split it between di- different bank functions. Here's the table I got from the Bank Policy Institute. It's really good. Essentially, what it does is it shows how you could split costs between different categories and different types of costs. One big thing to keep in mind is the exclusion of the charge-off costs. And the reason why that's important is the Fed excludes cost of losses, but the CFPB interprets this to include post-charge-off collection costs, effectively ignoring the debt collection industry and how they work with credit card companies. And the reason why this is really important is because Companies of different scales have different, what we like in economics to call the make versus buy uh, decision. Do you want to do something internally or do you want to make it into an external decision? Very large credit card companies will handle a lot of their collections internally. And and you can see other types of companies will outsource that. This really matters because it will basically make differences between the different types of institutions and types of cost reporting data that they report. Also, there's a real thing, and uh, I've noticed this in a number of different roles that I've worked on in the in the last year, but there or the last few years. But there are a lot of issues about whether to wait by accounts or transactions or by institutions. Well, the reason why that's important is because if there's scale in banking, and it's not unreasonable to think that there's scale in banking, very large banks can report much smaller unit costs. So the figure on the right, nicely put together shows that the difference between taking a weighted average of the fee-to-cost ratio, one is using accounts and the other one is using uh, weighting by institution. And you can see that there's a divergence. And the reason why is because when you see a data pattern like this is that there's very large institutions that have lower costs and, that, and are essentially driving the data. By using accounts as opposed to institutions, what you're essentially doing is you're driving costs to the smaller uh, to the smaller level, which makes it hard for other firms to compete. And I don't think it's unreasonable to to want there to be lots of competition and diversity in the market. Also, the data is from January 2016 through March 2022. Uh, there's an emphasis on the sub period since August 2021. Well. I believe something happened in 2020 that makes all the data very strange. And uh, before the CFPB goes and makes a multi-billion dollar decision that could really change a major industry, uh, maybe just waiting to cool your heels a little bit to see where the market shakes up after COVID and also the COVID responses like sending checks to everyone would actually be probably a good idea. But yeah, so they they do a real emphasis on the last few years of their data, which, of course, is probably not representative of what's going to be occurring in the industry for the next few years. I mean, let's hope it's not representative of what goes on in the industry for the next few years, since no one wants another pandemic. Um, Which gets to my major point about the CFPB. This is less an economics point and more uh, me as a former CFPB bureaucrat. So from the CFPB, their data, uh, you can find it on the webpage. They like to emphasize that they leverage full potential data to meet their mission. Uh, means they're proactively acquiring, analyzing, and publishing high-quality data. 
They believe they're a data-driven agency, a 21st century agency that uses data to, uh, to inform their decision making. The CFPB is committed to improving transparency and accessibility by providing the public with timely and reliable data that will enable them to make informed choices. Well, also from the CFPB, and this quote actually comes from the final rule, the CFPB does not agree it is improper to cite supervisory or other confidential data uh, as part of their statutory uh, functions, and it was lawful for them to get it, so they're going to do it here, and they basically release some aggregate data. My point is, is that if you're going to make such a huge change to such a major industry, you should be, be willing to show the data up to as much as possible. Also, using a data set designed by the Fed for a different purpose was probably not appropriate, given that CFPB has the statutory authority to collect data. And given that the uh, RMR, you're not in the know, uh, the Research Markets and Regulations Office of the CFPB has a $79.7 million budget in 2024. There should be some transparency. And quite frankly, they should be releasing as much as possible their data and their codes. There are like vague statements in there about how things pass uh, standard statistical levels. I have no idea what kind of models they used, whether uh, those models were appropriate. I can't tinker with them in order to see whether they did it correctly or anything like that. And neither can anyone else in industry do this. So I guess the point of this is um, at some point you got to, if you're going to say that you're an open, transparent agency, you know, trying to be a 21st century agency, you can't act like a 20th century agency telling people to accept what we tell you and this is the way it is. You should open your books and allow us to take a look and to make sure that, you know, what's the old legal expression? Uh, sunlight's the best disinfectant or something like that, some Supreme Court saying, that would be good here. So I just want to get into uh, very briefly because, uh, you know, deterrence. Well, the core model of deterrence is the Becker model. Like any really good economics model, it's groundbreaking when it comes out and then it quickly becomes just common sense. Essentially, a person commits an activity the expected benefit is greater than the expected cost. The benefit of a late of a late payment is a form of one month lending. It's strange because CFPB acknowledges this. In the quote down there, they tell you that if they give you a scenario where they say that eight dollars represents a seven hundred and thirty percent APR, I mean it's a very stylized example, saying that the minimum due was thirty nine dollars. Again, how representative that example is 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 completely up to you, up, you know. It can't be confirmed because there's no data to uh, to go through to to analyze it. But they're basically saying is that you know we're going to get the old model of deterrence, and now we're changing the punishment terms to eight dollars, or the uh, the penalty term to eight dollars, and therefore there will be no increase in uh, in deter late payment behavior. They say there's no meaningful increase in late payment behavior. They do this without providing evidence or elaborating what would happen when they weaken determines. deterrence. They say there are additional incentives for issuers to emphasize reminders of automatic payments and other mechanisms similar to better payment behavior. Again, this is all done in a very unsubstantiated way. There's no way to really confirm all this. And as I would like to point out is that if you're the one who's making the claims that goes outside the bounds of common sense, there should be an expectation that you back up your claim with actual data. And what's interesting is when this part of the uh, of the, their rule, they, they basically are treating consumers like they're making rational choices in the market. And that's essentially what a late payment is. It's a rational choice to make the late payment. Credit cards don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in a, in a competitive market for other types of lending. Um, unusual claims need to be substantiated. I don't think that's a controversial thing to say. The Bureau says that there's uh, available empirical evidence that an $8 late fee payment will not change the behavior of accounts based on the Y14 data. I was, when I'm writing this, I decided to be a little cheeky and say that, well, if you really believe this, please convince the IRS to reduce its uh, late payment penalties to the government. But of course, you know, they're not going to do that. But the upshot is there's no data, there's no code, there's no transparency. Um, the CFPB does reference the academic literature. They reference a paper well, uh, by Agarwal, who actually shows that there's learning via fees. He has a nice paper uh, using a proprietary data set. Now, admittedly, it's January 2002 to December 2004, but I like to say human behavior hasn't changed that much since uh, the early 2000s. Well, my younger daughter probably does think that, wait, 
she's fundamentally different than me. But anyways, the, uh, the monthly frequency of late PA, PA mids go down from 36% to 8% over time as counts age. The Bureau uh, rejects this study by saying it's of limited relevance, uh, mainly because of the data po- uh, period and also not addressing the actual $8. I would like to point out that when you have a $79 million research office or research markets and regulations office budget, and some other economists have shown you how to do this analysis, if you're going to do this in the future, you should probably update the analysis. Another paper they reject is Grodzicki. He finds that late payments are more likely when fees are less costly. Again, this falls under the economic literature of not groundbreaking work, but nice to have an estimate. They determined that he's not sufficiently robust data because a lot of his analysis came from 2010, 2011, which, of course, was a time period of great upheaval due to the Great Recession. But, of course, I can make the exact same claim about the CFPB using 2020, 2021, and 2022 data. Gather Good was actually an interesting paper. He uh, looks at um, late fees in the U.K., And he finds they're 6% in the first month, and they fall to 2.5% by the 23rd month, mainly because uh, the initial late fee, they set up automatic payments, things like that. Admittedly, this is not U.S. data, but it's interesting given, again, the CFPB's budget and all their resources, which would rival most academic uh, economics departments. They should be able to, uh, to be able to look into issues such as this. All right, risk management. Well, I actually started my career in risk management for a while. And as anyone who works in credit cards, there's a limited ability to price uh, risk with credit scores. I mean, you do your best, the better you're able to do it, the more profit you can make. There's a virtual cycle of incentives there. I would also like to point out that on other types of rules, the CFPB is trying to make credit scores less predictive. Uh, One rule that is, for for instance, the debt collection rule medical debt collection, credit cards would need, if you know less about your consumer and there's less predictive, obviously you would expect uh, lenders to be more um, more cautious and to limit a, uh, credit lines and possibly increase APRs. Late fees allow the person to face higher costs reflecting the delinquency risk. So when you give a late fee, it really says something about you. And also devices by banks and financial institutions to get people to pay on-time payments increases the signal value of the fee. So if you give like automatic payments, you give text message reminders, you do all these things for the customer and they're still late, it just amplifies the signal value that they are a bigger risk than you thought they were when they signed up for the credit card. Also, people do default and uh, late fees allow banks to claw part of the, the amount back so their exposure at default is less. And higher fees encourage consumers to reduce balances. And of course, Agarwal, his really nice paper that I mentioned earlier, shows that late fees drop as accounts ages. I feel like I'm going over time, so I'm going to go over quickly. This is my favorite graph from the CFPB. Basically, what they're showing is with the Y14 data, that if you're 30 days late, 60% of late payers pay within 30 days. It reminds me of a Simpsons quote. It was a joke where he's picking football games. He's like, well, when you're right 52% of the time, you're wrong 48% of the time. And Homer's like, well, why didn't you say that before? Well, of that 60% of people who eventually pay, well, conversely, that means 40% of people are not paying in the first 30 days, which means they're approaching the the 90-day delinquency really quickly. And given that 3% of accounts, uh, roughly, given whatever the economic cycle or where we are in the macroeconomic cycle at the time, only 3% of accounts ever really go delinquent, having a signal of 30 days late that gets you 40% to the two-thirds line, that's a very strong signal, which means late fees are very valuable as a risk management device. And it also means that as deterrence goes down, the value of that signal is going to go down, which means managing risk is going to get become harder. So I just wanted to emphasize that part. But again, the CFPB seems to forget that there's competition in this market. So how many issuers are needed for there to be competition? Two, 10? Well, the CFPB says there's 4,000 financial institutions that offer credit cards. And I took this uh, graph, again, from the Bank Policy Institute, uh, and they got it from S&P Global Market Intelligence. So basically, the the good old-fashioned 
Herfindahl Hirschman Market Concentration Index, which is standard in like DOJ FTC work. And it shows that the uh, issuance of credit card is, is, does not pass any of the concentration measures. So the key thing is that consumers are perfectly rational and they make decisions. They self-select into different types of credit cards offering different terms and different types of late fees. Well, to get around economic rationality, the CFPB hangs its uh, hat heavily on behavioral economics and trying to get into what they consider rational and attentive consumer uh, standard. So there's been a push in the last maybe 10 years of a lot of behavioral papers talking about the salience of fees in different industries. One of my classmates did a paper, or two of my classmates actually, because we were all classmates together. They did it on like cell phone usage and going over in your minutes. Of course, that became a mood issue since now we get unlimited minutes. Well, there's been some papers on financial products kind of using the same logic, saying that consumers, some people just don't pay attention. They pay the late fees and they're subsidizing those who do not pay attention. Well, the problem with behavioral economics, just going to jump to the next one, is that there's no general theory of behavioral economics. Now, Todd Zwicky over at George Mason University, he has a great paper on this. If you ever uh, want to read it, it's a law theory paper, but it's a really good one on uh, the problem with behavioral economics, the fact that there's a lack of a, of a general theory on behavioral economics. So if you say that, you know, 15% of people are not salient on, uh, don't have a salience on late fees. Well, that's a population measure. Are those 15% of the people who unpurposely pick credit cards with low late fees because they know they're going to trip the wire and then they go out of their way to uh, set up automatic payments and other types of commitment devices? Well, many of these ideas the CFPB does are essentially unarticulated. They, they cherry pick parts of the literature that serves their purpose for rulemaking. Uh, it's almost embarrassing to call this a cost-benefit analysis because there is almost no cost-benefit analysis in this rule. But, you know, in the behavioral economics, there's things like mental accounting. I put my money in different boxes and I manage those boxes and I don't cross them. So you see this sort of behavior where people will carry one type of debt and then a higher type of debt and they won't borrow from one to the other in order to, uh, you know, mathematically save money on interest rates or something like that. Okay, we, you know, there are papers that show that this phenomena exists, but how does it exist in the credit card market? Do people have the next point commitment devices to avoid their temptation by this? Hyperbolic discounting, the desire to, um, you know, why do tomorrow when you can goof off today kind of deal, kind of put off the future, be present bias. And then, of course, overconfident where you borrow more than you think you can uh, reasonably pay back. So these are all behavioral biases. They're kind of invoked in the final rule of kind of willy-nilly all over the place. But there's no systematic analysis as to which ones apply, what's a population statistic, what applies to particular people, and whether people have a way to get around it. So just a quick summary. I expect there to be an increased frequency of late fees caused by lower payments. Defensively, this means there's going to be, or there's going to be a change in annual percentage rates, APRs. Credit limits, minimum payments on other credit card terms. The increased risk of charge off and losses means that uh, basically defensive behavior. There'll be a decrease in access to credit and reduction in credit limits for customers with low credit scores caused by lower late fees. I mean, the super prime people who just use their credit card purely as revolvers, they're not going to be influenced by this. But the subprime is going to be badly hurt. And to give you an idea, 47% of subprime accounts paid no late fees. So it's not just subprime late uh, accounts are going to be hurt. It's going to be the subprime accounts who can't distinguish themselves from the, the late payer. So kind of the responsible subprime accounts who want to build their credit score and move up to a higher one. And then just to summarize also, it also seems like, and this is me just on a soapbox talking at this moment. Seems like the goal of a lot of these regulations is to standardize banking to the point that there's going to be very little variety. And uh, admittedly, the, the carve out of 1 million uh, accounts is at least leaving that part of the market out or to a limited extent. Standardization of banking means there's going to be less diversity in the market and probably a race to scale, which I don't think this regulation is good for the consumer. And I think it's poorly thought out. I could be wrong. It would be nice to see a detailed analysis to show me if I'm wrong. And uh, given that they want to change, make billions of dollars of changes in the market, 
there should be transparency. There should be as much as possible the attempt to um, to show their data and to show their code so that we can make sure that there's an honest assessment of the cost and benefits of these of this proposed rule. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the next thing we wanted to talk about, which Andrew covered briefly, was the impact to cardholders. Again, um, most people in the industry know that transactors and revolvers really shop differently for credit card terms. Final rule is expected to help a limited number of revolvers who aren't paying on time, but again, adversely impact all cardholders. As Andrew mentioned, the $8 late fee is not likely to encourage cardholders to make timely payments. Impact to the cardholders is they're going to pay more interest charges and it could impact their credit scores. Some of the changes that cardholders may experience include increased minimum payments, addition or increased annual fees, increased interest rates, lower credit limits, and what kills me is fewer credit card rewards or the elimination of rewards program. Now, this is something that we saw when debit card interchange was regulated as well, that that was one of the downstream impacts. Next, we'll talk about the impact to issuers. We expect there to be additional compliance costs, obviously, with revising disclosures, reprogramming systems and statements. Additional compliance costs, if you are going to use the fee based on cost, Annually, you're going to have to update your disclosures, your statements, if that fee changes. Additional costs, if you are in a correspondent banking relationship or a retail partnership for your credit card programs, um, you'll probably need to renegotiate the cost structure there in terms of the fee sharing based on the potential card portfolio being less profitable. Um, we also expect to see an impact on credit card securitization trusts. There'll be changes to credit card product repricing, product offerings. It's going to reduce competitive products, that's for sure. There'll be higher credit losses and more default exposure. Another thing to think about is if you have a card portfolio in your smaller bank, who if you were to just issue on your own, you would be subject to the exemption that Ron talked about earlier, and you instead have a joint marketing relationship with a larger issuer, you're not going to be covered by any of the exemptions. And so some of those smaller banks who could qualify by may want to revisit, but a lot of times they rely on the larger issuers because they don't have the infrastructure and house to run their own program. The other thing that may be an impact, like I said, we saw a similar impact in the debit card interchange fee regulation where even though the small card issuers are going to be exempt, they have the possibility where there may be economic competitive pressure for them to lower their late fees so they can remain competitive with the larger issuers. We have a slide that I just wanted to share that the CFPB is having some attacks on other credit card pricing. Um, they're going after margins. They're going after interest rates. And so now is the point where I turn you over to John. This is the part you've all been waiting for. Um, he's going to talk about the legal challenge. Take it away, John. Well, I, I think at this point, rather than launching into the history of the litigation and the different arguments that, that are being made, I probably should preview where we're ending up. And I'm going to invite Alan to uh, jump in and, and join me in commenting here. So we pretty much expected what would happen after the CFPB issued its rule uh, on March 5th. There's a, a race uh, to Texas. The trade associations uh, file attacking the rule. And when it gets to the CFPB's uh, turn to brief issues here, they raise the issue of venue. That is, is this really the right court? And is there enough of a connection to the Fort Worth Division of the Northern District of Texas to make it appropriate for the, this court and Judge Pittman to hear this case? And as we wind through that, we get a scathing order uh, from Judge Pittman 
denying a motion for expedited consideration of the pr- requested preliminary injunction prior to uh, ruling on venue. And I think we get about as strong a signal as we could possibly get from a sitting district court judge that he's not going to decide the case. He, uh, I think, made it clear that he didn't like the forum shopping going on here. He didn't like the impact on his docket and the case number of cases he has to wade through. And he particularly didn't like being lectured to, at least this seems to be the way he characterized it, being lectured to by um, uh, non-Texas lawyers, uh, lawyers from Washington, D.C., telling him how to run his, his docket and how to run his court and how to make decisions. So he really blasts the plaintiff's attorneys. He's invited the CFPB to file a motion to trans a notice of intent to transfer, which they did, and and basically set up set this case up for transfer to another district court. I think he's going to be very careful moving moving forward to avoid doing anything that might look like a final decision on the merits that would allow for an appeal, an appeal that could result in this case coming back to his docket. So he's not going to dismiss the case for improper venue. He's probably going to transfer the case. Transfer would not be an appealable interlocutory order. And I think our best guess at this point is he's going to send this case to the D.C. District Court. Alan, anything you'd like to add here? And if not, we'll... Don, I think you've done a uh, very good job of uh, summarizing events that have occurred so rapidly that it's been very difficult for us to keep up with it on our block. I would expect that the CFPB will be filing its actual motion to transfer very quickly. I think it probably will get filed today. Don't you think, John? Yeah, its venue brief is due today, and I have to think it's going to, although we haven't heard yeah. that it's been filed, have to think that it's going to include their yeah. there, there be, transfer. That would be the right strategy for them to pursue, because as you point out, an order transferring venue is not an appealable order. It's considered interlocutory, and therefore, uh, if he does transfer it, which I think it's almost a certainty he will, that that can't be appealed to the Fifth Circuit. I think it's extremely likely that the CFPB will ask for the case to be transferred to D.C. I can't imagine, actually, any other venue that the CFPB might designate as being the venue in which the case ought to be heard rather than D.C., which is, of course, uh, the main place where they are located. And, uh, and of course, uh, this is not a good result for the industry. It doesn't necessarily mean, and I don't think it does mean, that the industry is going to lose. I still think the industry has much stronger arguments for invalidating the $8 late fee safe harbor, but it's uh, different politics uh, involved. District of Columbia, the federal district court, uh, I think not dominated by conservative Republicans as the a lot of the federal district courts are in Texas, and there are more liberal judges on that court. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the place where the case goes after the judge decides uh, what to do, also more liberal, much more liberal than the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Fifth Circuit being the case that found that the CFPB was unconstitutional. So this is going to prolong this case. And uh, I think it, what it means is that for credit card issuers, they cannot 
you know, just stand still. A week ago, I think the the general uh, consensus was that, uh, or the prevailing wisdom was that there wouldn't be a need to expend a lot of resources coming into compliance with the rule. Now, I think anybody who doesn't start getting their the gears in motion is really making a big mistake because uh, while everything by may turn out fine by May 14th, nobody knows what the outcome is going to be. You know, I, I just want to go back and correct one thing I said about timing. It's actually the, the plaintiff's venue brief that's due today. So that's the the industry oh. brief and the, the CFPB's venue brief is is due, I guess it would be Tuesday of next week. But yeah. there's no question that their venue brief is going to include a motion to transfer. So they're they're fighting on procedure. They're not fighting really on substance. We can talk about, and we should talk about the substantive challenges uh, to the regulation because I think they've got an awful lot of merit. And I don't think it's uh, a foregone conclusion that a transfer to the, the D.C. District Court, which has a lot of experience dealing with administrative procedure and dealing with and reviewing agency regulations, is uh, just going to kowtow to the CFPB. Um, but let, let's talk a little bit about what those substantive arguments are. So the, the plaintiffs have argued that the rule, which, as Andrew indicated, is not very well supported by economic data, fails to comply with the Administrative Procedure Act for a number of, of reasons. They've included a Card Act uh, count, a, a Dodd-Frank count, sort of uh, mainstream uh, Administrative Procedure Act counts, and, and then even a, a Truth in Lending Act count regarding the effective date. So let me go through those just a little bit, and, and then we'll try to leave some time uh, at the end for discussing where we are. The first count is in, that's tied to the Administrative Procedures Act is that the CFPB didn't even pay attention to the requirements of the CARD Act, and it, it really made no effort to set standards for assessing whether the amount of a penalty fee is reasonable and proportional to the uh, emission or violation to which the fee or charge relates. Andrew has, I think, laid out the deficiencies in the analysis, and plaintiffs have argued strongly that the $8 safe harbor doesn't allow issue, issuers to charge fees that have any real deterrent value. The Industry has also argued that the CFPB hasn't even paid any attention to the obligations it has under Dodd-Frank uh, when engaging in rulemaking to look at the potential benefits and costs to consumers and covered persons, including the potential reduction of access by consumers to financial products and services. As we've discussed, it seems clear that that one consequence of this rule, should it stand, is that there will be reductions in credit limits, uh, there will be increases in minimum payments, and some consumers who might have gotten credit card accounts prior to the enactment of, of a rule like this are just not going to get accounts. Those are the subprime uh, consumers who just don't have an ability to distinguish themselves and, and show that they are consumers who, who will be able to perform and, and pay on time. Further, in terms of the arguments that have been made, I think this is kind of a real easy attack on the CFPB. They really, their actions were arbitrary and capricious. They didn't engage in reasoned decision making. They didn't explain their reasoning adequately, and they certainly didn't support their conclusions with substantial evidence. All of this tied to the economic uh, analyses that uh, Andrew discussed. They didn't make available for public comment or review uh, the data on which they substantially based their conclusions, making it difficult for the industry to respond fully. And I think uh, one of the very strong points here is that there's a longstanding rule in the Truth in Lending Act that requires that the regulatory agency in question issue rulemakings on kind of a rolling basis. This goes, we used to see this with the old 
official staff commentary where we'd get uh, an official staff commentary six months before the effective date, and then six months later, it would take effect. The same with other rules. There's a specific provision in regulation, I mean, sorry, in the Truth and Lending Act um, that requires regulations that require disclosures that differ from the disclosures previously required to have a delayed effective date of October 1, which follows at least by at least six months the date of promulgation. And uh, here, as we've discussed at length, this this rule was adopted on March 5th. It was published in the Federal Register on March 15th, giving a May 14th effective date and a, a time period that's so absurdly short. Uh, there's simply no way for um, the industry to comply. The Plaintiffs, not surprisingly, sought a, a preliminary injunction motion, tried to get an expedited hearing on the preliminary injunction motion. As we discussed, that didn't work. I think there, there are really strong arguments here as to why a preliminary injunction uh, is important, not the least of which is the, the, the impossibility of compliance uh, in the time that's specified. I want to just characterize the CFPB's response at a high level as sort of a, uh, in, in, res- in response to the complaint that they didn't follow appropriate procedures, do appropriate analyses. Um, they're saying, did to, did to, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's kind of it. They, they, they just are, I think, uh, largely hoping that uh, there won't be a, this, that this rule won't be contested in a, form favorable to issuers, and they'll just be able to sneak by on what they did. Um, Is venue proper? Um, Very briefly, Judge Pittman, in response to the briefings, uh, issued an order saying that he was weary about an attenuated nexus. We all thought he meant wary, uh, but it now seems maybe that he really looked at his docket and uh, and he did mean he's weary of of dealing with cases that he feels uh, don't have a sufficient tie to the Fort Worth uh, division so uh, we are going to have briefing on venue again as we said we really expect that the judge has signaled where this is going to come out he's going to reject the contention that venue is appropriate he's going to transfer the case to the DC circuit but that doesn't mean necessarily that the DC, I mean, sorry, the, the DC District Court, um, that the DC District Court will just rubber stamp what the CFPB has done here. Okay, the, the motion for the expedited consideration of a preliminary injunction was denied. That produced the scaling order we talked about. So, uh, Alan, you want to say a few words about a Congressional Review Act challenge and whether that has. Yeah, I already mentioned at the beginning, there's no hope of that uh, being successful, primarily because even if it were such a resolution were to get through the House and the Senate, it's a certainty that President Biden would veto it as he did the 1071 rule. In this case, this Lafey rule is actually part of his platform for re-election. So, and with this compressed the way the effective date uh, happening so quickly, there's no way this can be pushed off to the next uh, Congress. So uh, the no hope there. I guess uh, final observations about the case. We're running short of time, but does anybody uh, else, uh, John or uh, uh, Kristen or Andrew, Ron, uh, want to chime in with anything? Well, if no one else wants to chime in, uh, I think that the CFPB, I think the, I'm, I'm wondering if this line for small issuers wasn't designed in part uh, to make this uh, a difficult case uh, to bring in Texas because the diff- of the difficulty of finding a, a large issuer available to support venue. Um, the other comment I have is that this seems to be done in such a way that it's not just a reduction to eight dollars. It's going to squeeze the industry so much that the simple solution may simply be to not assess late fees at all uh, for some short period of time and and then circle back uh, to just turn off the late fee function uh, as a 
systems matter. Kristen, Ron, care to comment on that? Yeah, John, I think you're right. I mean, just from being in-house all those years, it's very difficult to quickly implement a change, to test it, to do it, you know, ensure you're doing everything correctly, to update all your media and disclosures. It's just a very difficult task for a financial institution to achieve in such a short period of time. And so my final observation is everyone's been dealt a losing hand here. Well, other than maybe uh, President Biden and Rohit Chobra. Well, to follow up on all the optimism, my worry is that if you look at credit card portfolios, they're not, we're not talking like massive profitability here. Like I think it's 5.9% and uh, is the return on assets. So if you take away late fees, that's going to be a major hit to the industry, which is going to either reduce lending or drive people out. And then you get other things like, who knows that the Credit Card Act goes or the Credit Competition Act goes through uh, regulating interchange fees. That could be another hit. Like It just seems like there's this movement of, on the margin, little changes that are aggregating to huge problems for a well-functioning financial market. Yeah, yeah. But that's just my view as an economist. I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. Well, we appreciate uh, your thoughts, Andrew. My thanks today to our speakers, John Colhane, Kristen Larson, Ron Vasky, and our very special guest, Andrew Nekrinis. To make sure you don't miss our future episodes, subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform, be it Apple Podcasts, YouTube Music, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please don't forget to check out our blog, also going by the name of ConsumerFinanceMonitor.com for daily insights on the consumer finance industry. If you have any questions or suggestions for our show, please email us at podcast, that singular podcast, at BallardSpar.com. And please stay tuned each Thursday for a new episode of our show. And I want to thank all of our listeners today and have a good day.